What's up guys, Alexander here with Date Psychology. So I want to bring a new topic to you guys today and we're going to ask a question and that's do smiles make a man less attractive? Is a man who is smiling in person, in his pictures, whatever the case may be, is he less attractive to women? Is it better to have a stoic face, neutral face, a mean, angry face? Well, let's look at what the research says about that. So what inspired this video, I saw another video by a date coach or something who, you can see it here in the slide, should you smile at women? Science has the answer. Okay, so we're looking at a paper here. The paper that is being cited to support this, the title of this paper, Happy Guys Finish Last, The Impact of Emotion Expressions on Sexual Attraction. So certainly from the title, you would think that having a happy expression would make you less attractive, particularly sexually attractive to women. So is that the case? Let's go forward and see what the research actually says about this. So going into this, I want to remind you guys of the replication crisis, right? The observation that about half of the studies or so in psychology don't replicate, right? That past findings, when you go back and you do the same study, when you go back and you do a similar study with better methodology, the results don't come out. So you've got to be skeptical anytime someone shows just a paper. They throw a paper out there and they say, this is it. This is the paper that proves this fact about human nature, or female nature, what the females are like, right? So that's something that you've got to be careful about. I put a paper uh, that was published this year on this topic. It's Another replication crisis paper, but I wanted to share it with you guys first because it's kind of interesting. What they did here was they sent a data set out to about 100 different researchers and they said, hey, here's the data. I want you to test this hypothesis. They didn't give them any instructions how, right? They just said, test this hypothesis. A bunch of these researchers came up with different results, some positive, some negative, some no results. You might ask, how can that be, right? They're using the exact same data. How can they all get different results? Well, certainly what this shows, a great deal of variability in the way that individual researchers test a hypothesis, even if they start with the exact same data. So that's another thing that contributes to the replication crisis, right? And aside from bad initial designs or different data sets, different samples, even when you have the exact same data, you can get a different result. So there's a lot to consider and there's a good reason to be skeptical of any individual study, not even going to tell you it's a bad study or anything like that, but you have to take these things into the context of what all of the research together shows, which is kind of what I think this video will be, be used to demonstrate. So also keep in mind what this video I watched kind of inspired this said was, you know, smiling is a low status thing or whatever. It's a uh, low dominance and low masculinity. Keep in mind that the research has been very, very mixed on if facial masculinity or signs of facial dominance, which are usually both measured by facial dimorphism, right? A more masculine, larger face actually predict attractiveness. Very, very mixed results. I did a research review on that. You can see the article here. You can go to the website and look at that if you want to kind of read through all of these mixed results, but something to consider there as well. Looking at this current video, I'll kind of describe how I selected these studies so you could do the same. You can get an idea, you know, that I didn't just go through and pick certain ones out that I wanted or something, you know. Certainly, I don't have any specific motive to believe that or care if smiles make a man more or less attractive, you know. Certainly, if you've watched my videos or seen my pictures on Instagram or whatever, you probably notice I'm not a big smiler. So I haven't taken any payments from Big Smile uh, from dental companies. Uh, Colgate has not paid me to do this video, I promise. So we're going to look at a review of studies on smiling of attractiveness, male and female, but with a focus on male attractiveness, because that's what the video I saw was originally about. And we're going to look at other papers published on this topic. And we're going to look also at papers that cited this specific paper being referenced. Why papers that cited this one specifically being referenced? Well, if it has been replicated, you can go through the citations. And when I say the citations, I don't mean the citations in that paper where they're saying citing other papers. I mean, papers that came after it that cite this one. If you go to like Google Scholar, you can find citations. 
And if it has been replicated, you'll find that replication somewhere in there if you go through all of them. This had about 70 other papers that cited it. So, but I'll tell you right now, there was no direct replication of this paper. So something to consider. It hasn't been replicated. That doesn't mean that it's not replicable or that the finding is wrong. It just means no one has, has tried, which is of course the norm for research in any field at all. Most has not been replicated. So, so for this video, I'm using a new tool, a new app called Research Rabbit. And the idea of Research Rabbit, it's, it's an academic search, but it categorizes papers and networks by their relevance to one another. So I went through, I found the most relevant paper. You can see I also looked through all of the newest research, right? So any papers that came after the paper, which might have referenced it, that would be related to it in themes, in topics, and that sort of thing, as well as a general thing. I probably went, I didn't go through all of these, you know, it was like 1,200 papers. I probably went through the first 300 or so of these, just straight down the list. So that's how I came up with these papers. Are there others that could have tested this hypothesis that I missed? Almost certainly there's at least one of them out there. I would be surprised if there isn't. That's going to be the case with any kind of review. Uh, but this is probably going to give at least the ones that this research rabbit tool sees to be the most relevant, the most related. And going through the citations of all of the papers I'm going to mention here, the papers that they referenced, all of that was actually captured in this research rabbit tool. So it seems to do a pretty good job of finding kind of related papers. So that gives you an idea kind of, of how I went through and got these papers and, and also an idea of a cool tool that you can use for your own research, for your own papers. You know, this is something used by professional academics as well. So a good tool, something that I hope can help you guys out. Let's go on. So I'm going to give you first a summary of what I found here. Okay. This is going to be a quick summary table of the papers that I reviewed, what I found. So there were actually no papers in the search that I found that showed that smiles made male faces less attractive or any other ratings of attractiveness. It was like willingness to date or whatever. I didn't find one. And you might think, well, there has to be at least one because that's the paper that was originally referenced in the video, right? Surely that one did. It actually didn't either. So it was kind of misreported as to what it actually shows. I'll go a little bit into that. Uh, we can see here what I did find, okay? So of these papers, these 22 papers that tested this hypothesis very specifically, effect of smiling male faces, all male faces here, by the way, guys, I read a lot that had to do with female faces only, or a lot of these included male and female faces. So these are the effects of male faces specifically. Uh, the effect seems to be even stronger for female faces, which is something that was mentioned in that paper, which is actually correct. So a smile on a female face seems to have an even stronger effect on attractiveness for male faces. But as you can see from the results here, most of the research published on this shows that smiling male faces are more attractive. Okay, none of them, zero, had a negative effect. There was one that I put here as a contextual effect. Why? Because in one condition, it showed more attractive. In another condition, it showed less attractive. I think I will mention that in a little bit here and no results, right? No results in this case are papers that showed no difference across the conditions. And the two conditions I'm specifically looking at here are smiling faces and neutral faces. Because if you compare the faces to other emotions like crying faces, sad faces, those are almost always rated as less attractive. Now the original paper here found that prideful faces were rated as more attractive. That's the only paper in all of these that I came across that used an alternate facial expression of any type that was more attractive. So if there was another box on here, you could put that, you know, like prideful faces or something. You could say, okay, there is at least one paper out there that found this prideful expression was more attractive than a smile and more attractive than, oh, actually, no, it wasn't more attractive than neutral faces in that paper. It was more attractive than smiling faces important and we will kind of go over that. So in the next slide here, this is a table. You can pause this if you want to go through and I will actually put a link up or maybe to a Excel document with uh, maybe the links to all of these papers or the titles so they're easier for you to find. But you can pause it and see where these specific papers fell. I'm not going to cover all of these because it's just too much. But these are the ones. I will talk about other papers that tested similar hypotheses a little bit. And also in the link that I put up, 
those will be in there. I reviewed maybe about 50 or 60 papers in total for this. So, And those are the ones that tested specifically the hypothesis of smiling faces attractiveness. Now we can look at some of these papers that I selected that, that talk about the research on smiles and attractiveness. This will kind of give you an idea of what is out there and what kind of effects smiles might have, not just on attractive, but also on other variables that are associated with male attractiveness as well, right? Like what could those be? Extroversion, intelligence, trustworthiness, different personality variables that co-vary with male attractiveness. So first study, this is the original study. We might as well go over this first. Tracy and Beale, 2011. What was reported, right, was that smiling makes you less attractive. What they actually found, there was no difference between happy faces and neutral faces. There was no difference between happy faces and any of the other faces for that matter, nor was there any difference between neutral faces and any of the other faces, right? Shame, neutral, da da da. There was a difference between the happy face, okay, and the prideful face, right? And you can see on the chart here, why is that? Well, the happy face got the lowest score and the prideful the highest. So that distance between the two was enough to say, this is a statistically significant difference, right? That the difference was probably not due to chance given this data set. But that doesn't show that a happy face, right? A smiling face is less attractive, right? It doesn't show that you would be better off taking a Tinder photo with a neutral expression, your normal face, than you would smiling, for example. It could show, you know, a prideful expression. You might want to go for that. But again, it's the only paper that has found that as far as I can see. So something to consider there. Going on now to the next slide. So in Goli or Goal uh, and colleagues in 2014, here we see just an, another example and a few other references here. Male faces were judged as more attractive when they were smiling. And in fact, in this study, even some of the less attractive faces were judged as more attractive when they were smiling than attractive faces were when they were not smiling. So this actually showed a pretty strong effect on facial attractiveness for smiling, which is a pretty consistent result actually, that having a smile in a photo can make facial attractiveness increase enough where it actually raises, you know, that attractiveness more than, than someone that might actually be, have more of an attractive identity. You know, they'll talk about facial identity, which is kind of the, I guess the default you could say in an individual uh, data point for attractiveness. So the effect, pretty strong here. You can kind of see in the charts there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of these studies. I'm going to go over a few of them. In the next one here, we have Morrison and colleagues, 2013. What they say here, why would a smile be more attractive? Well, again, you can see here, this, this is a study that I think did not find a statistically significant result between uh, neutral faces and between the smiling faces. It did find differences, for example, uh, between the faces that show all of these other emotions, which is important to consider because certainly, you know, one of the things associated with pride in the original paper by Tracy and Beale is anger. Uh, typically, the pride expression and the anger expression are often associated, but usually what we consistently see, in fact, I think it's been very consistent in all of these papers that I will go through, is that happy faces are more attractive than angry faces. Often, they are not more attractive than neutral faces. They're equally attractive. There's no difference. But other emotions, negative emotions, are usually lower attractiveness. So, worth keeping in mind there. And why? Why? Why would it be more attractive? A smile? Well, an evolutionary uh, explanation here is that it implies positive intent, right? It implies a willingness to form a pair bond, right? It, it implies that this is a person who is safe, right? And contrary to a lot of popular narrative from date coaches and people telling you, you know, you got to be dangerous and, and even that kind of bad boy image, uh, a big part of what makes people, men, I should say, what makes men attractive in an evolutionary psychology context is them being safe. And why is that? Because men pose a threat to women in that evolutionary psychology perspective. Every time women 
have a relationship with a man, it is a risk. And not when I say a risk, I talk about, for example, physical violence potentially from that person because you meet a strange man in an ancestral environment. You don't know if he's going to help you or hurt you. But not just that. Having a relationship with a man is a risk. Why? And this is talked about as a large risk in evolutionary psychology because pregnancy is a risk. Pregnancy is a huge cost for a woman and a huge risk, and thus the selection of a mate, and this is true even for short-term or long-term mating conditions, is potentially a huge, huge risk for women. And this is probably one of the reasons as well that the dual mate hypothesis, right, the idea that women select certain men for short-term mates, certain men for long-term mates, is something that has not replicated well, right? Because that short-term mating isn't quite as consistent with the much more consistent observation in evolutionary psychology that having a relationship with a man, getting pregnant by a man, that sort of thing is a big risk to health, to uh, future status, etc., etc. Going on now to the next slide. Morrison and colleagues, this same. They comment on this first paper by Tracy and Beale. I wasn't actually going to go into the methods of this study that much, except that I saw they commented on it, so I thought, okay, I'll include it. Because I don't like when people take a study and they go through and they find some limitations and they say, ah, this study's bad because it has this limitation, da, da, da. Because every study has a thousand limitations to it. You can go through any study and say, oh, well, I don't like this part, so I'm not going to believe the results. That's not a good way to assess if an effect is real. A better way is to do kind of what I'm doing here, which is go over a lot of research examining the same hypothesis and see where that research falls. If you go through and nitpick a study, but this is actually, you know, a pretty large methodological, methodolog ah, it's a big problem with the methodology. Why is that? Because you can see at the bottom here, this is the image, not from Morrison. This is the image from the original study of what a happy face was, a prideful face, a sad face, right? And a neutral face. Well, you can see that these are not even faces. These are bodily expressions to begin with. And that certainly there is a great deal of difference between three conditions here and the prideful expression, right? You have a man smiling and a man in a neutral position, basically the same. You have another man who's looking down and then you have the prideful one where he's like, yeah, yeah. So you have a million confounds in this experiment already. You don't know that the prideful expression makes a man's face more attractive. You can barely even see his face. He's looking up. You can barely see the face of the other man. He's looking down. And that's important because gaze, the direction of gaze, is one of the things that you'll see in these other studies that come up that contribute to a man's facial attractiveness. Averted gaze versus eye contact. Big, big predictors of how strongly a face is rated as far as attractiveness or unattractiveness. So Tracy and Beale here, they introduced kind of a big confound in their methodology. They could say these are expressions of happiness and pride, but you're comparing fundamentally different things. And that's kind of what Morrison noted when he found different results. He said, <clears throat> you know, Tracy and Bill, they used photographs from the waist up with varying head orientations. Uh, upward tilts increase male facial attractiveness, like you see in the prideful condition here. Downward tilts decrease male attractiveness or increase female attractiveness in this case and that sort of thing. So, like they say, the present study had no variation in head tilt, right? They were very standardized, the photos, and they got a different result from Tracy and Beale. So you have to wonder, you know, did this one study stand out so much in saying that smiling was less attractive because they set up very, very different conditions for the smile versus the pride? You know, probably could be the case there. So, what else? Ah, kind of what I said, looking at this slide, you know, this is an example of a facial stimuli from O'Doherty, uh, I'm sure I said that wrong as well, who's a, uh, a neuroscientist. He does a lot of research on the brain, and we'll go into one of his studies briefly as well. But a lot of facial attractiveness research uses stimuli like this. Everything except for the face is cut out, or at the very least, you know, they standardize the background. They, you know, make sure that it's cut off. They try to get them as equal as they can. Why? Because a haircut can change the attractiveness of a face, the background. There's a lot of research on colors, right? Men wearing red shirts 
are rated as more attractive than men wearing green shirts, and that even varies according to the rater, right? Like some of the research on the hormonal effects has found that women who are in the ovulatory period uh, are more likely to rate men with red shirts as more desirable for short-term mating context. So even very, very tiny, tiny cues can change ratings of facial attractiveness. So one of the things you have to do here is you have to cut the face out. You have to make it look like that mask in that old Mark Twain claymation thing that was so creepy there. You know, I don't know if you guys remember that or not, but hopefully that jogs your memory. Of course, there is a limitation inherent in this methodology as well, right? And the idea, the limitation, the question is, how generalizable is a isolated face just floating there to actual behaviors with a person? And certainly that's something that has been addressed in a lot of research as well, right? Where instead of using faces, they have men in videos, you know, moving around. And there have been effects of movement on assessments of attractiveness, just movement by itself. Lots of things. So with every type of methodology, there are limitations unique to that methodology. That's another reason I don't like to go through a study and nitpick a limitation and say, oh, I don't like this study because it did that. They're all going to have some limitation and those limitations can affect the outcome and understanding how they might can kind of help you put that study into some context. So all interesting, worth to consider there. Going on to the next slide. Morrison and colleagues here. What were the strengths of this? Okay, sure. So one of the things that was different from the Tracy and Beale study was that we should expect men and women to share perceptions of opposite sex and same sex attractiveness. This is a very, very consistent finding, right? Men and women are really good at rating the faces of both men and women fairly accurately, right? If you take a group of men and you have them rate male faces, they will assign ratings to those male faces pretty similarly to the way that women do. So anytime you see a big disconnect between the way that women rate a face and men, you kind of have to wonder, you know, like, ah, that's kind of strange. What's, what's going on there? So something worth considering. They said, uh, just a quotation here from that paper as well. A happy expression signals positive mood and intent, implying that it is worthwhile socially to interact with someone. So, you know, another explanation. Why would a smiling face be more attractive? Well, you know, one potential explanation for that. Moving on, we can look at Akubu and colleagues in 2015, long-term versus short-term mating. I think that's a question that many of you will probably ask. I'd like to kind of anticipate that. You know, you think, well, maybe the effect of a smiling face will be different in women seeking a long-term partner versus a short-term partner. Certainly, like I mentioned, the risk to women, uh, the dual mate hypothesis, that sort of thing. If you're coming at it from that perspective, you might think, you know, you know, a smiling face, if it signals safety or stability or something that might be more valuable for a long-term relationship, uh, less for a short-term relationship. That's kind of what Akubu and uh, colleagues found here, uh, sort of, because we see at the very least in both European and East Asian samples that they used, the smiling face was more desirable for a long-term relationship. But for the European sample, there was no difference in the smiling and the neutral face for a short-term relationship. In the East Asian sample, there actually was, and it was a significant relationship, very small, but nonetheless significant, statistically significant, right? Because Significance isn't a measure of effect size, right? It doesn't mean that the relationship is large. It just means that it, it was produced probably beyond chance if you were to replicate it many, many times with the same data set. So what does that tell us? What can you kind of glean from that, right? Given that it kind of signaled this long-term desirability, smiling face in both conditions, maybe that's a real effect. For the European condition, it did not signal a difference for short-term mating. So assume that the effect is real. You know, that wouldn't tell you that smiling is worse. It would say it's the same, right? You could smile or you could not smile. Do whatever you want with your face, you know, between those two conditions. And it's probably not going to change your desirability for a hookup, right? For a short-term mating context. Uh, Moving on to the next slide, we can see also what they looked at here were some other variables, right? 
uh, masculinity, maturity, and trustworthiness. And again, this is kind of consistent with that evolutionary observation. Masculinity was a little bit higher. Maturity was also a little bit higher for the non-smiling faces. Uh, in Tracy and Bill, I believe they also mentioned, you know, non-smiling faces versus pride might also be a masculinity signal. As I mentioned at the beginning, the relationship between facial masculinity and attractiveness, it's not clear. There's a lot of mixed results on that, you know, and when you're seeing a lot of mixed results like that published, is the effect real? Maybe, you know, if it is real, is it going to be large? Probably not. So this relationship between having a very masculine face and being the most attractive face, not quite so clear. The trustworthiness thing here for the smiling face, again, consistent with the long-term relationship, uh, but not only the long-term relationship, because in past research as well, signs of trustworthiness also signal desirability in a short-term relationship. Why might that be? Well, consider, again, remember, any potential interaction, relationship with a man, for women, from that evolutionary point of view, is a potential risk to physical harm from violence, as well as the risk of childbirth, of pregnancy, and that sort of thing. So trustworthiness is important, even in short-term mating context, which a lot of people, you know, kind of in, in the manosphere, dating coaches, they, they get that part really wrong, but that's the case as well. So another reason, perhaps, why you might see a smiling face being more attractive for long-term relationships, and, you know, perhaps even for short-term, although not demonstrated in this study. A strength of this study as well was that it, it's a within subjects design. I'll kind of tell you guys what that is just to kind of help uh, contribute to knowledge about methodology and that sort of thing, right? When you have everyone in a study, right, and they are exposed to both conditions within subject. When you take a portion of your group and you say, we're going to put them here, a portion here, you know, you have kind of a between groups design. And when you have everyone exposed to both, that can kind of reduce uh, identity effects, right? And what that means is, you know, you have a group here and they rate a bunch of faces. You have a different group and they rate a bunch of different faces. Well, you're talking about different people, right? And there's variation of those different people. When you have that group in a within subjects design, you don't have to account for that same variation, you know, something uh, to consider there that that it is a, a a kind of a benefit. It makes the study easier. This also lets you use uh, an effectively larger sample. Uh, the actual size of your sample won't be larger, but the power of your study will be. The power meaning that you will have you know an effectively larger sample exposed to a condition and thus more power to detect an effect. Important in psychology because effects tend to be pretty small, so you need what are kind of relatively large samples compared to a lot of other fields, you know, in something like medicine or neuroscience, maybe you have 20 people in psychology, you're going to need more if you want to detect anything at all. Another strength of this, this used male models and it used the same male models in the smiling and unsmiling condition. So probably we're talking about men that are more attractive in this case, you know, so also interesting to consider. And we will actually look at that in a little bit in an additional study coming up because that raises another question, doesn't it? The effect of smiling could be different for men who are high in attractiveness versus men who are low in attractiveness. If you're high in attractiveness, you have a great smile. Maybe the smile helps you even more. If you're low in attractiveness, maybe the smile is worse. Maybe the smile makes you worse. Maybe the smile makes you worse if you're in the middle. You know, well, we'll see in a little bit, right? Quotation from this author here, the smiling advantage for long-term partners supports our hypothesis based on the idea of evolutionary strategy in the mate choice for parenting, right? The idea of that long-term selection for a mate to raise your children. Looking at a more recent study here, Shields and colleagues, okay. Kind of what we just mentioned, smiling increased attractiveness for a highly attractive men but it had no effect for low attractive men in this study. So, kind of what I, what I just said, right? Someone who is attractive, when they smile, that could be a behavior that enhances that attractiveness. Someone who is not, maybe it doesn't benefit at all. Certainly, again, we have another study here where 
we don't see the original claim, right? We don't see that smiling made it worse. We just see that smiling had no effect. Smiling made it better, on the other hand, for more attractive men. So I think this is probably the study that I had marked as the contextual uh, effect, right? Because the context here being the initial attractiveness of, of the man being used as, as the stimulus. So the effect here is small, as I mentioned in the slide. Uh, very, very small effect. This is a decile scale, and you can so you can uh, see, you know, kind of intuitively what the effect is, right? It's it's not a point. It's not even half a point. Is it like 20% of, of a point? You know, you go up from a 5 to a 5.2 or something with a smile if you are an attractive man. So is it a large effect? No, it's not. Next slide here. Uh, this study also looked at ERPs, right, with an EEG, the cap on your head with all of the little electrodes, okay? So this is another way that you can approach these questions. Certainly, this is actually, I think, why the video caught my eye, because I'm doing a monograph right now on the neuroscience of facial attractiveness, and I was reading stuff about smiles, and then I saw the video and thought, ah, oh, that doesn't sound quite right. But... This was an ERP study, and like I said, that's another way that you can look at these questions. You can say, ah, you know, is there an interaction with smiling and attractiveness that is reflected in brain regions or brain responses that are associated with attractiveness? Well, probably not super surprising given how small the effect was in the actual ratings that they did not detect an effect of attractiveness and smiling, right? So smiling didn't change anything either way. They did find an effect of low versus high attractiveness, which is kind of uh, referential to the last video that I made or the one before that. You know, can you see attractiveness in the brain? Certainly there's a great deal of research in neuroscience that says you can. If you look at the uh, slide here, I'll kind of explain how to interpret this. You can see the different lines for the high attractive, low attractive smiling, low attractive low attractive smiling and neutral uh, and down at the bottom you can see time where those signals differed across groups how much they differed is going to give you you know your statistical significance is that difference beyond chance given the data and it will tell you for how long it was so you can see that little dip there right and that's going to be the exposure uh, when the image is presented in high attractive versus low attractive faces. Basically, high attractive faces kind of give you that higher signal in that region, that electrical signal that is transcranially projected to those electrodes. So attractiveness, you know, there's a saying uh, in incel communities and stuff, they say, oh, attractiveness is only uh, the difference of a few millimeters of bone or something like that. You know, you could say as well, that attractiveness is only the difference of 200 milliseconds of electricity in that case. That's kind of what these uh, ERP studies, these signals tend to show when you look at neuroscientific research into facial attractiveness. Next slide here. Uh, this is another study, a, a neuroimaging study, right? Neuroscience study on facial attractiveness. And in this one, they did kind of detect an effect, okay? So quotation from the study here. The degree of activation in the orbital frontal cortex to attractive faces was modulated by the extent to which subjects perceived the presence of a mildly positive facial expression manifested as a smile. You can see the effect size in the chart and you can see the neuroimaging uh, of the area, right? That area is going to be the amount that it is stimulated above the non-smiling condition. So, Happy faces, certainly uh, more activation. Intermediate faces, a little bit less, and neutral faces, less. So this is an area in the brain that's associated with perceptions of facial attractiveness specifically. You see more activation in the orbital frontal cortex in this area when the face is both attractive and smiling, right? And that happy, intermediate, and neutral, they used faces that had were neutral, little bit of a smile, yeah, big smile. So the larger the smile, the more activation in that interaction with attractive faces in the area of the brain that responds to you know, perception of facial attractiveness. Is that evidence that 
the smile is you know a attractiveness a facially attractiveness enhancing uh, feature or behavior you know it might be it might be next slide here so this is a classic study from recent colleagues in 1990 right the title you know what is smiling is beautiful and good so they found again the effect of a smile on facial attractiveness smiling faces were more attractive but not only were smiling faces more attractive smiling faces were perceived to have more personality features that are associated with attractiveness both with physical attractiveness and with uh, relationship desirability right because there's a lot of personality traits that make a man more attractive and when they're high in those personality traits women perceive men as more attractive often they're actually correlated with like real facial attractiveness you know personality traits can actually be correlated with like physical traits even though they usually aren't large associations and they predict you know like desirability for relationships often for short-term as well as long-term relationships you know, I said this earlier, I'll say it again, I made a video on this. A lot of the traits that women want in short-term relationships, hookups and stuff, they also want in a long-term mate. The idea that they're like two entirely different things is not the case. What makes someone attractive as a long-term partner, usually it's, it's gonna make them attractive as a, as a short-term partner as well. Also, and I made a video on that as well, women's short-term partners tend to be prospective long-term partners. Most of the people, men, women hook up with, they would probably date them as well, you know. So traits here that were significant in this, sincerity, sociability, and competence, right? Competence is a big one for attractiveness, right? And competence is one of the traits that uh, it's believed that the dark triad actually mimics, right? There's a lot of research on why the dark triad, which is psychopathy, uh, narcissism, and Machiavellianism, why is that attractive to women? Well, there was you know, a recent interview with evolutionary psychologist David Buss and Jordan Peterson, another psychologist, and you know, they, they discussed that. They said, you know, probably these are things that mimic competence. They basically, they trick women into thinking it's someone who is, is competent. Well, you know, if smiling is associated with higher competence, might be another uh, good indication that smiling is associated with higher attractiveness right especially you know i mean even apart from the actual direct measurement the, the main effect of smiling on attractiveness you see that smiling yeah it predicts attractiveness but it also predicts these other things which co-vary with attractiveness so more evidence there in making the case for for smiling here for big tooth uh lao 1982 this is a chinese sample right because that's another question that you want to ask in psychology we use what are called weird studies right uh, not intentionally, but because, you know, we, I'm speaking English, I live in the West. Uh, most of your, your samples are going to be taken from college students. It's kind of what it is. So weird, what is it, you know, Western, educated, affluent, and, and democratic, something like that. So you're talking, basically what you're talking about is like Western college students. So sometimes you want to know, uh, especially if you're talking about something like attractiveness, is this a cultural effect or is it really universal? So it's good to look at some samples and studies that have non-Western populations. Well, great. So what did they find? Quick summary here. They used four separate measures of attractiveness, right? Smiling men were rated as more attractive across all of those. In addition, smiling men were rated as more intelligent. So interestingly, they didn't find that same effect for women, that women who had kind of small smiles were rated as more intelligent, but like big smiles made them seem less intelligent. So kind of kind of interesting there. So what did Lao say here? A quote from this that kind of stood out to me. She said, a smile literally increased one's face value. And next slide. So Jones and colleagues. Now this one is only female faces. Everything I've showed you up to this point, including the studies in the original, all male faces, but I wanted to show you uh, one that was female faces that because I wanted to show you the effect that gaze can have. It was mentioned in the past, you know, you saw the confound with gaze in the original study looking up, also the guy with his arms up. So faces with direct gazes were more attractive when smiling. A woman looking at you smiling is more attractive. But a woman looking away smiling, less attractive. She's rated as more attractive when she's looking away and not smiling. Uh, this is something that actually has been shown in male faces as well. Uh, I mentioned there, I, well, I have a little uh, uh, citation up there. Ewing and colleagues 
did the same thing with male faces. This gaze effect, you know, we're looking at someone in the eyes, looking at them face to face, makes someone more attractive, usually. Uh, pretty consistent, you know, that was an interesting paper with evolutionary psychologist uh, Gillian Rhodes as well, who wrote a great deal about the evolutionary psychology of facial attractiveness. So for the male version of that, you know, you can kind of check out that paper as well. Ada and colleagues, 1996. So smiles enhanced perceptions of attractiveness and of extroversion as well. So good to uh, consider here. So again, we see smiles, you know, more attractive. Great. But also we see that smiles make a man appear more extroverted. Why do I mention that? Why is that important? Extroversion is a very large predictor of male desirability, both for short-term and for long-term relationships. Okay. I think many of you, you know, that follow this channel or any, any personality psychology dating probably know that extroversion has that really big effect for all sorts of things, even like good relationships, relationship satisfaction. It's kind of a personality trait that gives people a really, really big advantage in a lot of areas in life and, you know, in dating as well. And so if a smile predicts perceptions of higher extroversion, does that additionally help aside from that main effect of the smile making a face seem more attractive? Perhaps, perhaps. And let's see the next slide here. So Yuda and colleagues, okay. I put this, I said, the more smiley, the more attractive, right? So what I mean by this is not, you know, walk around smiling like a clown all the time. What they did was they kind of like I mentioned in, I believe the study by O'Doherty, which was the neuroimaging fMRI study I put up in the previous slide. They had a face neutral, a little bit of smile, a little bit more smile, yeah, big smile. So you have these different smiling conditions. And what they found was a linear effect. The larger the smile, the more it predicted uh, ratings of facial attractiveness there, okay? So certainly it was, you know, better than a neutral face, statistically significant, better than a sad face. Again, sad faces always lower, always lower. Facial expression, if you had to pick, you know, you can pick a smile, you can pick a neutral face. Maybe the smile will give you a benefit, maybe not. But, you know, don't, don't cry. Don't put up a photo where you're crying on Tinder. That will probably not help you, and that seems to be very consistent in the research. So, uh, as you can see here, uh, clown chat. Patusco and colleagues. This is kind of a different study. This is a study from cosmetic dentistry, where they looked at the contribution to variance in facial attractiveness that was predicted by specific components of the face. Certainly, there's a lot of discussion when people talk about facial attractiveness, when you read certain lines of research in facial attractiveness, as to which parts of the male face are most important, right? Is it the cheekbones? Is it having a big masculine dimorphic jaw? Is it having eyes, big old eyes or hunter eyes? Certainly, you know, there are many, many people that will analyze the minute details of your face. You know, perhaps you can pay them money and they will do it for you as well. So here's a study on that. And what did they find? that the mouth, that the smile was the largest contributor in variance to facial attractiveness. And by a lot, guys, by a lot. Uh, the correlation with the smile and associations of facial attractiveness, much higher than the eyes, the chin, the nose. So smile, big, big deal. There was another paper. I don't think I included this, but I will mention it. This assessed the smile from an evolutionary psychology perspective. Wasn't an experiment, just a review, which I think is why I did not mention it. But they talk about the teeth as being essentially like ornamentation, right? As signals of ornamentation. That the teeth signal youth, they signal health, they signal, uh, you know, even things like status, that sort of thing. They looked at associations of teeth health with like BMI in, in countries where people were largely kind of in food scarcity, you know, found higher BMI, all sorts of things like that. And the idea was, okay, you know, the mouth, the smile is attractive because it is an honest signal evolutionarily of health, of reproductive success, and so on. Honest signal being a trait that accurately or correctly or, you know, like really signifies that someone is, you know, going to be more fertile or that they're going to have desirable traits as a mate or that they're going to, you know, have a better immune system or any of those desirability things. A signal that really correlates with something else that we're able to perceive and that influences our mate decisions in that sense. So certainly the evolutionary perspective on smiles is kind of, you know, that smiles are good. 
you know, why did you evolve this positive emotion expression if it's shit, right? If, if people don't like it, you know, why would you smile in the presence of a woman that you like? You know, you're happy with someone, you're smiling. If that uh, like screwed your mate chances up. There's a lot of things that should make you question right off the bat if you're thinking about it from an evolutionary psychology point of view uh, about, you know, like why would a smile uh, not be attractive? You should expect it to be attractive. And, you know, the research, as you've seen, there's a lot of no results. It's certainly not, you know, a really strong effect. The effects are not big, but there's not a lot of evidence that it's going to hurt, you know. Next slide. So another thing that was mentioned, both in the original video that I referenced, as well as in uh, this paper, which I think is probably more actually the point of the paper, right, is pride. So what they found in the original paper, right, was that pride, the prideful expression, which was the man, you know, the, the lone man with his arms up was rated as more attractive than the smiling condition. So pride is an attractive expression. Is that correct? Usually we think of pride as something negative. Certainly that's kind of the uh, perspective, I think, from Western culture where pride is associated with uh, the sins, right? The seven sins. It's one of the sins. Well, pride is probably the best sin. From a psychological point of view, pride mostly, it's a good thing, okay? Pride is usually a good thing. Thing. I'm going to go over some research really quick on that. Uh, I think the guy in the original video, if he's talking about, you know, you should be prideful and stuff, I think he mostly got that right, but we should also qualify what we mean by pride in that case uh, within psychology. So Martin's couple of studies by Sheriff, Sheriff and Tracy, the original author, she's one of the ones. Pride is an evolutionary uh, signal of status, right? Uh, that's something that a lot of the research on pride will tell you that seems to be pretty consistent is that, okay, pride is a status signal. People are prideful because they've done something good, because they have something, or they want to show off or whatever. So pride is basically a signal of status. And it's, again, it's what's called one of those honest signals, right? It's probably an accurate signal of status. A lot of people aren't being prideful if they feel like they're down low, if they're losers or whatever. Usually if someone is being kind of prideful, you know, they, they think they're the shit. Sometimes, you know, maybe they have a reason to think that. So it's not something that just comes out of nowhere. But again, you know, unless you're just kind of inventing it, which I think maybe will not work out for you, which seems to be the case with a lot of people trying to mimic behaviors and personality. It doesn't actually seem to work well in practice, but pride expressions of it do seem to signal that status. And so why is that important, right? Behaviorally, status is an attractive thing right? Consistent with, with, you know, personality, psychology explorations into status with mate decisions, you know, higher status men being more desirable, something that you can find across many, many measures of status like income or education, uh, you know, ability, competence is also a status measure, all sorts of things. So if pride is a signal of status, pride could be a more attractive behavior or feature and thus expressions associated with pride may be more attractive. You know, I'm just thinking, is there a facial expression associated with pride? If you look again at the image in the original study, you have the guy looking up, you can barely see his face, and he's like, yeah, his arms are up. So, okay, he looks like he just scored a goal. But is there like a facial expression? Like there's what's called a, a I think, I don't know if I'm saying it right, like a Duchenne smile, right? And so there's authentic smiles, and then there's the fake smile, the Duchenne smile, and you go, e -e -e. so is there like a fake uh facial expression of pride? Well, I don't know. I don't know. So I wonder if pride is even something that you would really measure purely as a facial expression. Perhaps that is why Tracy and Beale didn't do it and they had to make the person bodily express pride because unlike smiling and neutral face, can you express pride just from your face? I don't know. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think uh, as someone who is not super Facially expressive, I don't think I could do it. So the other study here, okay, Williams and DeSetno. Pride was also associated with higher dominance, okay? Dominance is a status thing, right? The two pathways to status kind of explored in evolutionary psychology are dominance and prestige, right? So higher dominance and higher prestige tend to make someone higher status. And the second thing it predicted was likability. That might surprise you because I think a lot of the people who 
kind of are attracted to that kind of video who are going to see like, oh, you should be prideful. I don't think they're thinking like, oh, you know, uh, this is going to make me a more likable person. I think rather they're trying to kind of emulate like that dark vibe, right? Like, oh, I want to be tough and dark and, and mysterious and a little bit aggressive and a little bit dangerous. Well, let's go to the next slide and we can talk about that. Okay. What we're talking about now is pride, authentic versus hubristic pride. And this is kind of how pride is broken down in psychology. Authentic pride. Win your pride because you have actually accomplished something, right? You won the goal, you won the game, and you feel good for it, and you're congratulating your teammates, and you're saying, yeah, we're the best. And then there's hubristic pride where, where you actually kind of suck, but you're like, oh, yeah, I'm the shit, even though you're really not, you know? So just kind of giving you an idea. There is a pro-social pride, and there is an anti-social pride. And that pro-social pride tends to be the one that is associated with that attractiveness with likability. Again, very consistent with uh, the research on pro-social behavior, with evolutionary uh, psychology explanations for selection for pro-social behavior, that pro-social behavior tends to be more attractive than anti-social behavior, and it tends to predict better relationship outcomes, better life outcomes, and that sort of a thing. So Wubbin and colleagues here, the first point, right? Pride, authentic versus hubristic. Authentic pride signals pro-social behaviors. Hubristic pride signals anti-social behaviors. Tracy, again, another paper, the same author of the original study. Okay, she did a paper on authentic and hubristic pride, how that contributes to relationship outcomes. Okay, authentic pride, it's associated with good relationship outcomes. So consistent with the other paper that shows that authentic pride might make someone more likable as well. Hubristic pride, hmm, bad news. It is associated with poor relationship outcomes, right? Breakups and infidelity and that sort of a thing. So, you know, people that are seeing, you know, like, oh, pride is good, and then they're interpreting it in some way that would be that hubristic pride, they're missing the point of the research. They're missing what was actually found in the research. They're going down a path that's probably not going to make them more attractive, not going to make them more likable. Women aren't going to like them more and will sabotage their relationships, right? That if they do act out in a way that is prideful hubristically in their interactions, in their romantic relationships, is going to predispose them to a poorer end of that relationship. So, moving on here, the final thoughts, and I'm going to conclude this very quickly. The big take-home point, I think, here that, that can contribute to how you think about research in general is that you shouldn't base an ideology on a single paper, right? You shouldn't assume even that a single paper actually supports a hypothesis. That's, you know, kind of the way we talk about uh, hypothesis, you know, it's called hypothesis testing. But if you get a significant result, you, you know, you test the hypothesis, you get the result that you wanted and you say, yeah, this supports the hypothesis. Does it really? Well, there's, you know, kind of a, a technical sense in statistics where you might say no, where actually, you know, where you support uh, what you were testing in that data set, but to support the hypothesis over the long run, you have to look at a research line and it's kind of outside of the scope of just, you know, statistics that give you a number at that point. And that's kind of how I think you should think in terms of research lines. And when I say research line, what do I mean? I mean, you look at the whole body of research that is following a specific hypothesis and you see where that goes, kind of like uh, we did in this video. So you would say, okay, you know, smiles, attractive or not. What do they say? You wouldn't want to just do a paper or read a paper and say, okay, that's it. You could get it very wrong as in this case, right? You also, you know, if you're a researcher, you wouldn't want to just say, okay, I'm going to test it. Okay, good. I got a good result from my, my hypothesis, so I believe it. That's going to probably mislead you too. This is something that you have to follow as time progresses, right? You have to follow the body of research. You have to see where the evidence accumulates over time. And once you have a lot of evidence accumulated across many, many different studies, then you can kind of start to form, you know, a belief. You know, you can say, this is something I have seen very, very consistently across many studies, across time, across different samples, across different methodologies, testing the thing. And that huge collection of evidence 
you know, I think is enough for me to form a belief that I feel secure in or even enough for me to form an opinion. So think about it that way, guys. Research lines, not individual papers. Uh, yeah, This video sponsored by Teeth. You should uh, brush them and take care of them. If you have, you know, bad teeth, maybe don't smile. Uh, and that's it, guys. I hope you liked the video. I'll make another for you guys very soon.